Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Mike and today we're going to be talking about rolling trades and more specifically how we can keep track of them in our mind. So this is one of the more, the more complicated concepts when we're talking about how to keep track of certain credits we receive or even debits if we roll for a debit, which we don't really do here. But really, we're going to talk about the important thing to keep in mind, which is going to be keeping track of the extrinsic value of the trade and how that relates to your break even point and really how to think about that trade going forward from the portfolio perspective, which really doesn't keep track of rolling trades. So let's go to the first side and we'll talk about rolling and what it really means in its entirety. So when we're talking about rolling, basically what we're doing is making sure that we're keeping our dream alive. So when we roll, we're closing our current position. So it if we're selling an option or selling a strategy, we would be buying back that strategy and then selling a new one in a different expiration cycle. So ideally, we wanna make sure that we're rolling for a credit. We always roll for a credit. At the very least, we'll roll for a zero debit, so just basically nothing, no credit, no debit, just zero. And we always like to roll for a credit because it helps our break evens ultimately and ultimately reduces our cost basis by doing so. So when we roll for a credit, we're always gonna make sure that we're doing so and when we're looking at different options, it's gonna be easier for some and harder for others. So with naked options, it's actually a lot easier to roll for a credit because I can definitely just buy back my option that I'm currently in and open up a new option in a next expiration cycle. So if I'm dealing with maybe a naked put or a naked call, which we're going to exemplify here, when I'm rolling those, it's gonna be really easy to get a credit because if you think about it from an insurance contract perspective, the longer dated options or longer dated insurance contracts that have more time, they're going to be more valuable. So if I'm using the same strike and I'm looking at the difference between an option that has 45 days to go and an option that has three days to go or two days to go, like ones expiring this Friday, the ones expiring this Friday are definitely gonna be less valuable than the ones that are on the same exact strike but 45 days out. And that's because there's more time for the option owner to be correct and therefore we would have to be compensated for holding the risk on that option as option sellers. So when we're doing rolls for naked options, it's actually a lot easier and it gets a little harder for spreads. So I did do a whiteboard on why it's hard to roll credit spreads for a credit. So if you missed that one, definitely check it out. And really what, we're, what we really wanna make sure that we're keeping in mind is that when we roll, we are keeping the dream alive, but we're actually opening a lower probability trade. Because when we're rolling, we're basically rolling defensively. So if I'm selling an option, that means that my option is most likely in the money if I'm rolling. And if my option is in the money, it's going to be a lower probability trade because we want our options to be out of the money. So if I'm closing my in the money option and opening a new in the money option, I'm basically selling an in the money option and that means I need that the the stock price to actually move in my favor for that option to become out of the money. So it's going to be a lower probability trade. So it's really important to keep that in mind as we're rolling. But let's really get into a example here. We're going to talk about an example with a short put and I'm gonna walk through exactly how we would make sure to keep the extrinsic value in mind. So on the next slide, we're gonna start off with just a short put example, and we're gonna pretend like we're selling a 95 put, and I did not keep track of the stock price in these two examples, because I think it's really important to just understand the math and really focus on the extrinsic value. So we're selling an out of the money put, which really just means it's a put below the stock price, and we're gonna be selling that for $1. Now since it's out of the money right now, that total credit of $1 is fully extrinsic value. This option has no intrinsic value because there's no real value to it. If someone owned this put, there's no reason for them to exercise it if the put is below the stock price. Because a put contract from the owner side or the buyer side is the right to sell 100 shares of stock. So why would they exercise their put that's below the stock price when they can just sell their shares in the market itself? So that's why when we look at puts being out of the money, we're looking at puts that are below the stock price, and the opposite is true for calls. So calls out of the money would be above the stock price. But focusing on this example, let's assume that we're selling this out of the money put at 95 for a $1 credit. 
Now let's say at some point down the, the road, the trade goes against us and the stock price actually dips below our short put and we decide to roll. So what we do is we buy back our current expiration put at 95 and to roll, we just have to sell a new option to basically keep the dream alive. So we're buying back our 95 put and we're gonna be selling a new 95 put in a further dated expiration cycle. And because this short put has more time on its side than this long put does, there's gonna be more value in the put we sell than the put we buy. So it's really important to keep that in mind when we're dealing with naked options. So because of that, I can actually collect a credit. So let's say I collected a 30 cent credit as you see here. So my first roll, I had to buy back my put for a loss, but since I wanna keep the, the dream alive and I have the same assumption, I'm going to open up a new put, same strike and a different expiration that's further out in time. And because I'm pushing it further out in time, I'm able to collect even more of a credit. So I collected 30 cents and maybe 20, 30 days go by and I realized that the stock price has stayed right around the same price. It hasn't gone up above my strike, which is exactly what I would want, but I still have the same assumption so I decide to roll again. So I would do the exact same thing. I would now be short this option here, but if I wanna roll again, I need to close that option out, so I'm buying it back, and then I'm selling out a new option, same strike in a different expiration that's further out in time. And let's say I'm able to collect another 30 cents for that roll. And let's pretend that this stock price is actually at 90. So now I know that my put is five points in the money, and let's say that the value of this put here is actually worth $6. So the raw value of the put option is $6. Well, what do I know? Well, what I need to keep track of is the extrinsic value. If I keep track of the extrinsic value in rolling, what I can do is put a pin on that number and realize that I need to buy back my current position for that amount to break even. So let's total all that up. So I originally sold it for $1. I rolled it once for a 30 cent credit and then I rolled it again for another 30 cent credit. So I have a total extrinsic value credit of $1.60. So basically I collected this premium and I can use that premium to offset any losses that I may have incurred. But now I've got an open position and this is where it gets tricky from the portfolio page standpoint because the portfolio page on any platform doesn't keep track of rolling. It only shows you the open position. So what you're gonna see right when I roll this position, even though I know I'm at a loss, it's going to show me as a PL of zero. Right when I open this new position, regardless of what the value is, it's going to show me a PL of zero. So if my raw value of this new option that I've, I've just rolled, I've just got a brand new option, but the raw value is $6. What I need to realize is that I've collected a total of $1.60, and to break even on this trade, I need to buy back this option for $1.60. If I collected $1.60, and I can buy the option back for $1.60, that would put me at a real PL of zero. So why is this important? Well, if I know that my new position is going to have a raw value of $6 in this example, what I need to know is that I'm gonna see a pretty big gain or profit on my portfolio page even though I'm not even close to being break even. So if my raw value is at $6, and let's say the, the stock price actually comes up a little bit to 91, maybe my position would go down to $5. On my portfolio page, I'm gonna show that as a $100 profit. But in my mind, I know that that's not true because I've rolled this position multiple times. So if I keep track of my extrinsic value credit, I'm able to keep track of where I need to buy back that position to break even. So let's talk about it from this perspective. If I've got a raw value of $6 right from the get-go, but I know I collected $1.60, I'm gonna have to see a profit or a gain on the portfolio page of $440 before I know that I'm at break even. If I just subtract my credit from the total raw value, that's the gain I'm going to see. So I'm gonna see, if I actually get to that point, which would be great, I'm gonna see a P&L of positive $440, but in reality, it's going to be at a position where I'm going to be able to buy back this put for $1.60, which is my true break even. So that's why it can get kind of confusing, especially when we roll a bunch of times and we see the P&L reset every single time we roll on the portfolio page. So be sure to keep this credit in mind and really use that as your break even point. If I collected $1.60, regardless of the raw value of the 
position that I hold, I know I need to buy it back for that same credit amount to break even. So let's go into the next slide and we'll talk about another example with a strangle here. So we're gonna use the same sort of example, but we're gonna use it to the upside. So again, we're focusing on the extrinsic value of the trade. So with a strangle, I'm just selling an out of the money put and I'm selling an out of the money call. So this is a little bit different. It's more of a delta neutral strategy where I want the stock price to stay within this range, which differs from the short put where I really would just want the stock price to stay anywhere above the strike. So I want the stock price to stay in the range and I sold this strangle for $1 credit. A couple days go by and the, act, the stock price actually breaches my call side this time. So let's say I'm four or five days until expiration and what I do is I realize that my put's going to expire worthless so I just let it expire worthless. So I've erased it from this line so we can get it out of our heads and just focus on the extrinsic value of the call side now. So I'm going to roll the call side because I believe that the stock price just came up really too hard at this point and I think it's gonna come back down. So what I can do is roll the position for a credit. So I'm gonna buy back this same call, which is the same call I sold here. I'm gonna buy it back and I'm gonna sell a new call on the same exact strike in a different expiration that's further out in time. So I'm doing the exact same thing, except this side, I'm, this, in this example, I'm just using calls here. So I'm able to do that for a 20 cent credit. So I wait, I wait, I wait, I wait maybe 15, 20 days, and the same thing happens. The stock price doesn't really go anywhere. It goes even further up, which is gonna be bad for my position. But I know that because I'm dealing with a naked option, I'm able to roll it again. So let's say this time I can collect 30 cents for that additional roll. So I'm buying back my call option here, and I'm selling out my new call option here. So what do I need to do? Well, just the same exact thing. Total up the extrinsic value. So I originally sold it for $1. I rolled it once for a 20 cent credit, and then I rolled it again for a 30 cent credit, which brings me to a total credit of $1.50. So let's say that my raw value call is $5.50. You know it's gonna be trading for at least $5 because it's five points in the money, and we have to be trading for over intrinsic value, otherwise there would be an arbitrage opportunity. So we assume that there's going to be at least $5, and we can calculate here that we've got $5.50 of extrinsic value, where $5 is the intrinsic, 50 cents is the extrinsic. But really what we need to focus on is the raw value compared to my total credit. So what do I need to do? Well, I have a raw value now of $5.50 for this in the money call that I've currently sold, but I know that I total, collected a total of $1.50. So I subtract that value and I get $4. So since my P&L is going to be reset every single time I roll, I'm going to see a gain of $400 on my new position before I know that I've broken even. So again, I need to buy back this raw value call that's trading at $5.50 for $1.50 before I break even because I collected $1.50. If I collect $1.50 and I'm able to buy it back for $1.50, that's really where I break even. So this is why it's so important to really keep track of the extrinsic value in the roles that we complete in order to make it easy on ourselves from a portfolio page perspective when we're seeing gains, but they're really not profitable gains. They're just gains on that current position, but we need to keep track of our overall break even. So it's important to keep that extrinsic value in mind. And really all we need to do is remember, if I collected $1.50 or if I collected a certain amount, if I can buy back that position for that same amount, that is my true break even. So let's wrap this all together with some takeaways for you. The very first takeaway we've got is really, again, to keep track of that extrinsic value. If we're going inverted, that's where it gets really tricky, where we have to consider the total collection and reduce that total collection by the width of the strikes because we're always focusing on the extrinsic value. With inverted strategies, we know we're gonna have to buy back that position for the distance between the strikes. So it's a lot easier when we're dealing with just single options or options that are just going in the money. When we go inverted, we have to remember to reduce the total credit by the intrinsic value that's going to be in that position at expiration. And really, rolling helps us keep the dream alive. But we also need to remember that we are opening a lower probability trade. So even though we keep the dream alive, we are having a lower probability trade, even though we're still reducing the cost basis by 20 or 30 cents in these examples, we might be able to put our capital at better use elsewhere. So 
So be sure to assess the market before rolling and just make sure that we're not getting ourselves into a deep hole. If I've got a really deep in the money option and I'm only collecting 10 cents or 15 cents to roll it, and it's gonna be an even lower probability if it's super deep in the money, I might just take the trade off, accept the loss, and deploy a higher probability trade where I can maybe capture a lot more premium elsewhere. So it's really important to assess the market and make sure that we're using our capital efficiently. So thanks so much for tuning in. Hopefully this helps you look at your portfolio page a little differently. If you've got any questions or feedback, shoot me an email here, or you can follow me at Doe Trader Mike. Stay tuned though, we've got Jim Schultz coming up next. Hey everyone, I hope you liked this video. Click below to watch more videos, subscribe to our channel, or go to our website.